I think it's fascinating. I mean, me personally, not just our history here in, in this country, but the history of the world. I, huh? What? Oh, hey guys and gals, it's your buddies Drew and Ralphie with Living History Mysteries and Ferocious Feline Productions. You know, with the recent coronation of King Charles, I was looking into a little bit of English history. The not so well known stuff. And I ran across an interesting story about a not so known queen, I guess you could call her, even though well, needless to say, she didn't really reign that long. I'm talking about Lady Jean Grey. Not that Jean Grey, this Jean Grey. She had a very, very short term on the throne. And well, I don't really want to go into a lot of detail without having all the facts for you guys. So go on and check this out because this is good. Dying at the age of just 15 in 1553, 
and his premature death triggered a succession crisis. As Edward had been Henry VIII's only legitimate son, next in line for the throne was his half-sister Mary. She was the daughter of Henry and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. But there was a problem with Mary. She was a devout Catholic, extremely opposed to Protestantism. Edward, as well as his advisors, had been appalled by the idea that Mary would ascend to the English throne. As a result, with the support of the Regency Council, Edward had stipulated that Mary should not succeed him. So, who was to be England's new ruler? The answer was Lady Jane Grey. We left her earlier, not long after her birth. During her childhood, she'd had the benefit of a classical education, studying Latin and Greek, as well as Hebrew and Italian. And crucially, from the point of view of Edward and his supporters, she was a staunch Protestant. In their eyes, that alone trumped Mary's claim to the throne. Four days after Edward's death in July 1553, Jane learned that she was now the Queen of England and Ireland. She accepted her new position, although apparently with no great enthusiasm. It had already been a momentous year for the teenager, as in May she had married Lord Guilford Dudley. Jane's new father-in-law was the Duke of Northumberland, who had been the leading figure in Edward VI's Regency Council. That Northumberland was strongly in favor of Jane becoming queen was hardly a surprise. Not only would it prevent Catholic Mary from succeeding, but it would also mean his own son would become royalty. After being made queen, Jane now retreated to the Tower of London. This was the tradition. The new monarch waited in the security of the tower until the coronation ceremony could take place. Mary, on the other hand, traveled to East Anglia in eastern England, suspicious and fearful of Northumberland. Mary's suspicions were well-founded. Northumberland now set out from London, determined to capture Mary and neutralize her claim to the throne. But a few days later, on July 9, 1553, members of the Privy Council, a key body of state, declared for Mary rather than Jane. Events now move quickly. Jane and her husband Dudley were placed under arrest in the Tower of London on the same day as the Privy Council's declaration of support for Mary. The unfortunate teenage girl had only been queen since July 10th, making her reign just nine days long. Jane's principal supporter, Northumberland, was arrested and beheaded before a crowd of 10,000 in the following month. And Jane and Dudley were now in a position of great danger. They were both accused of high treason, as was Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, whom we met earlier. All the defendants were found guilty and sentenced to death, but Mary appears to have hesitated. The sentence on Jane and Dudley was not immediately carried out, but then in 1554 came Wyatt's Rebellion, an uprising sparked by the planned marriage of the now Mary I to the Catholic King of Spain. Jane's father and two of her uncles joined the rebellion, which was comprehensively crushed by Mary and her supporters. Mary decided it was now time to act against Jane and Dudley, Dudley was executed first on February 12th, 1554, publicly beheaded on London's Tower Hill. Jane is said to have seen his headless body crumpled in a cart as it was returned to the tower. A little time later that day, it was Jane's turn. She was now a girl of 16 or 17. Because of her royal ancestry, she was accorded the privilege of a private beheading before a small gathering. Catholic Mary I was to rule until her death in 1558. That was time enough for her to earn the nickname of Bloody Mary because of the vicious and deadly persecution of Protestants that she oversaw during her reign. Welcome back. You know, it's like I said in the beginning, Lady Jean Grey had a very, very short term, a very short reign on the throne of England and frankly the reasoning behind it was really messed up but it was a different time and a different place and a different way of thinking it's all not all that dissimilar from our own country in certain ways where actions are taken things are done and then Things are done to change it, and well, you can't help but wonder if maybe things should have been left alone in the way they were in the beginning. It happens in our everyday life, 
It happens with our government. It happens with our industry. Mistakes are made, but how do you go back from those mistakes? But that's all I got for you guys today. Just a reminder, don't forget, next weekend, I will be at the Niles, Michigan Renaissance Fair. This is my third year doing security for them. Great group of people, fun gathering, and lots to see and do. You've got great vendors, you've got great showmen. Come by and see me. I'll be the only security guy there. I'll be easy to recognize. But that's all I got for you guys today. As always, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. God bless you. God love you, I do. We'll see you in history.